welcome to Mary now. She's welcome again in 10, 15 minutes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. So I think the reason I've been invited to talk here today is I'm just finishing up a PhD in the UK housing system and the role of finance within it. Now this means I've had the kind of formidable task of collapsing three years research into about 10 to 15 minutes. So bear with me. Um, the way I'm going to try and deal with this is uh, by assuming that you're familiar with the many atrocities in the, contained in the current government's housing policies, particularly with regard to social housing. And so I take my time to try and look a bit deeper into the roots of the current housing system uh, with a view to trying to understand how we got to where we are today. So I'm going to argue that the roots of the contemporary housing system lie in the 1980s and with three developments in particular. Now these are first the cutting back of local authority building and the selling off of existing council housing. Second, a massive expansion of mortgage lending following financial liberalisation. And third, which is related to the first, uh, is our dependence for housing supply, for the majority of our housing supply, on private spe sector speculative house builders. So, looking at cuts to social housing, first of all, <coughs> uh, Thatcher's most famous attack on social housing was probably making the right to buy compulsory for all councils. So it gave every, everyone the right to buy who was living in the council house, subject to certain conditions. Though I think as important were the constraints that she placed on council's ability to build new housing to replace stock that was sold on. Now, one way of understanding the right to buy and these restrictions on council housing is an, is an attempt to hasten the residualisation of council housing. So by residualisation, I mean a process whereby local authority housing came to serve only the most marginal or disadvantaged in society. This is a long-term process. It had its roots long before Thatcher in the 1980s. Um, we can think of it in terms of if in the immediate period after the First World War when council house building first started taking place on a significant scale, council houses tended to be built for the skilled working class. So this is the era of homes for heroes. Gradually, in the later interwar period and especially in the post-war period, most council housing came to be built to house those displaced by slum clearance. And so you see the shift in the social status, essentially, of council house tenants. So it was a longer term process, but what the right to, die, right to buy did is massively speed it up by facilitating the exit from the tenure of both the most well-off tenants and the best housing stock. Now one of the most obvious consequences of these attacks on the then existing form of social housing is that it drastically reduced the availability of social housing. So as Mick mentioned, um, since council housing stock has been diminished so much, those eligible those who are eligible for some sort of housing support have depended on housing benefit, uh, which this is a consumption subsidy rather than an investment subsidy, and essentially serves as a means for the government to perpetually feed money to private landlords, money that could be invested in new stock. Um, and I think some of the present government's most objectionable housing policies, and have in mind housing benefit cap, the bedroom tax, are attempts to manage the costs of this irrational system. Uh, without developing a more functional model of social housing to replace it with. <coughs> so it's a policy of containment, essentially. Okay. Now the flip side of the more li limited availability of social housing uh, is that it drove everyone for whom it was an option uh, into the owner-occupied sector. So, and I think this was intentional. I think part of the agenda of the right to buy was to divide the population into a mainstream for whom owner occupation was the norm and an aspiration and an underclass who were confined to social housing whose standards could deteriorate without anyone else worrying too much. I think that was kind of the image that underpinned it. Um, now, and you can see Thatcher at the time did promote owner occupation as a kind of a natural and desirable tenure form, something everyone should aspire to. And a crucial aspect of this promotion was the idea that housing could be an asset as well as a form of shelter. So I think this idea of home ownership um, is tied up in the Thatcher era, and I'm referring to Thatcher, I think the same is true of Major, Blair, there were signs of a change of direction in Brown, but they never really got off the ground, and we're pretty much still where we were then. Um, so I'm using Thatcher kind of as shorthand. Um, but yeah, the idea, since the Thatcher era, the idea of home ownership has become tied up with a particular view of the relationship between the state and the individual. 
it's a desire to move away from the collectivist model of universal welfare provision that prevailed since the Second World War in the post-war period and move towards a more individualistic model in which the costs and risks of old age or social disadvantage or individual uh, mishap are borne by individuals through their personal savings and accumulation of assets rather than everyone funding a model via the state where everyone's taken care of in that way. Um, so yeah, the promotion of owner occupation gets couched in terms of this kind of welfare reform come cultural engineering programme. And housing plays a central role in that because it's most people's main asset. That's the intention. And that's why owner occupation is promoted as both an asset as well as a form of shelter. So moving on to point two, which was the expansion of finance. At the same time as the Thatcher government was uh, promoting owner occupation, Reforms were taking place in the financial sector, in the mortgage market in particular, that was leading to an influx of finance into the mortgage market. So particularly important in Britain were the changes that led to the removal of privileges for building societies, which encouraged the entry of retail banks into the sector. Um, but it was also an era of liberalisation of international capital markets and the founding and import of securitisation from the US. Now, all of these factors led to a greater availability of mortgage finance, both in terms of the amount of finance available and in terms of the level of risk that lenders were willing to take on. Um, and this fitted in with Thatcher's pursuit of a society of homeowners by helping people access owner occupation. It expanded effective demand, essentially, which provided upward pressure on house prices. And so you get this mutually reinforcing cycle, reinforcing cycle between house prices and lending. So on the one hand, exp expansion of mortgage lending drives up house prices. On the other hand, ongoing lending, especially lending to the most marginal, those kind of on the cusp of owner occupation who are seen as the most high risk, is justified, at least in part, on the basis of rising house prices. The idea being that if these lenders are going to default, it matters less if the value of the underlying asset has risen in the meantime. So additional lending justified on this basis in turn drives up house prices further and so it goes on. And housing as, as an asset fits neatly into this picture because of course the more house prices rise, the greater the capital gains home ownership and the more attractive it is as an asset. And we've seen this kind of extreme combination of this in the current phenomenon of international investors buying properties in London with ever, without ever having seen the property or ever intending to live in it. You know, we see housing, British housing, serving as a vehicle for international savings, essentially. Its, its role or function as a house way, yeah. has become irrelevant, except for the Londoners who are squeezed out of the housing market. Um, so to sum up what I've said so far, in the 1980s, you get on the one hand, you get expanded demand for owner occupation because on the one hand of cuts in social housing, on the other hand of an expansion of mortgage lending, uh, both of which drive up house prices. This increase in house prices encourages further mortgage lending by lenders, and further demand by owner-occupiers who are seeking capital gain from their housing. Um, now, before I talk about what's wrong with this model, I'm sure you can <laughs> kind of see for yourself, it's fairly self-evident, uh, there's a picture of the, there's an element of the picture missing, which is housing supply. Um, so to say that an expansion of demand for owner-occupation drove up house prices begs the question immediately, at least for economists, of why supply didn't expand to meet demand. Now, the, the debate about this tends to focus on the question of planning versus land banking. So one side says planning in the UK is too restrictive. There, aren't, there isn't enough land made available to develop. The other side says oh, there's plenty of land. It's the, pr the problem is with house builders who sit on the land and wait for it to accumulate value rather than building out on it. Now, my own view is that there's truth in both sides of these. So by international comparison, the UK does have a very restricted planning system. Um, and there are advantageous reforms that could be introduced. Now, I know it's, there's a need for care here because I don't want to come across as a laissez-faire, build out an order green belt, et cetera, et cetera. There are plenty of good reasons for having a planning system. Environmental protection, quality of development. I don't know if anyone's ever taken a bus from New York City to Boston. But the sites that you see on that journey are a testament to the importance of controlling the quality of development and organisation of it. It's just a mess. Um, and, of course, planning in recent years has been used as a means of securing or encouraging the provision of affordable housing. So I'm not saying no planning or very loose planning. It's more that 
Britain would benefit from having a less discretionary and a less politicised planning system, such as zoning, which is the system they have in the Netherlands and in Germany, and also from a better alignment of economic incentives with the interests of those ultimately responsible for decision making. So I think planning is important. I also think land speculation by house builders is important. So one of the consequences of the cutting back of social of council house building is that, as I said at the beginning, we're, we're dependent for the overwhelming majority of our housing supply on speculative house builders. Now speculative house builders are builders who build for profit and they do so by buying land and building houses on it without agreeing a buyer in advance. Now the distinctive characteristic of such builders is that any change in the land value between the point at which they buy it and the point at which they sell it with the house built on affects their profit. If the land goes up, they appropriate that value as profit. If the land value of the land goes down in the interim, they make a loss on that land. So house builders, it is within the very kind of profit-making structure of speculative house builders that they have to speculate on land. It's an inherent characteristic of them. Anyone who denies this is just lying. It might not be that they're making enormous profits by speculating on land. It might not be that it's the main source of undersupply in the UK housing system, but speculative house builders do speculate on land. They have, if they didn't, they wouldn't survive for a day. And so what exactly the reason for undersupply is, whether it's planning or whether it's a speculative character of house builders, I think it's hard to say. It's probably a bit of both. We can compare the UK, for example, to countries like Spain and Ireland, who have similar housing systems in the sense that they're dominated by speculative house builders with much looser planning systems. And there you did get a much bigger increase in supply during the time of the boom, but you've also seen a much more dramatic crash subsequently. So you still get the cyclical behaviour, which I think is a product of the speculative activities of house builders. Um, okay, good. Okay, so I'll, I'll make... It's complicated. Both are a problem, is essentially my view. And I would add one... We can talk about it more in the discussion. Um, I'd add one final point, that not since really the 1930s, arguably the 1950s, have speculative house builders built on a mass scale. So what was distinctive about the earlier part of the century is that you had a steady house price deflation. And this encouraged speculative house builders to adopt a, a model of mass production. If, you're, if they're operating in a period of house price inflation, so above inflation, house price increases, the incentive to play the inflation, sit on land and wait for it to accumulate value, is much greater. Um, and that's been the case in the UK since the 1970s, with some cyclical interruption. Um, so this suggests, this is taking it back to the beginning, really, which is saying that the reason for undersupply comes back to the cut back in council housing, because speculative house builders' output has been pretty constant, again, with cyclical elements since the 1980s. And the reason that we've developed a crisis of undersupply is because one of the major contributors of supply, i.e. councils, has disappeared. I hope that's clear. To sum up, um, what, where I think all this leads is that there are two fundamental contradictions at the heart of the British housing system. The first is the idea that owner occupation can be both the dominant or the default tenure form and at the same time serve as a lucrative asset, a means of, for accumulating capital gains. The contradiction there being the first aspect mass home ownership requires affordability, the second aspect, asset, using housing as an asset or getting capital gains from it requires constant house price increases. And the second contradiction is our dependence for all our housing supply on speculative house builders whose profit depends on capturing land uplift as well as on building. So for the reasons I've just described, I don't think in the current environment it's ever going to be, speculative builders are ever going to provide housing on the scale that we need it because it's not profitable for them to do so. So in the period of the early 2000s, the abundance of finance helped to kind of smooth over these contradictions by bridging the growing affordability gap. So it was moving people on the margins into home ownership uh, at the same time as it was driving up house prices. But the global financial crisis exposed both contradictions and since we've been in a crisis of both supply and affordability. 
Now, I think all of the government's current policy responses can be criticised on the grounds that it's, it's, they are more geared towards returning to or propping up the previous system than addressing these problems at their root and moving to a new, more functional system. Now, most notably on the demand side, help to buy, is where the government ensures the or guarantees the equity of mortgage loans, part of the equity of mortgage loans. Um, it's quite ge clearly geared, I think, towards shifting those on the margins into own occupation. So I don't know if anyone saw the article, I think it was late last week, in the G2 about gentrification about the housing estate up in Hackney. Mm -hmm. They had a nice phrase in there which was said that young professionals, first-time buyers, are the pandas of the current political and housing system, or housing political economy, by which it means they're the ones that uh, all pol politicians like to coo over and they're all terrified of them going out, going extinct. <laughs> <laughs> so <coughs> help to buy clearly geared towards helping those people. Its broader effect on the system is to drive up house prices and exacerbate affordability problems. On the supply side, now there is some, there's in, I think increasing recognition that supply is the fundamental problem. Um, but so far, attempts to address it are restricted to planning reform, which, because it doesn't address the structure of the house building industry and our dependence on, dependence on speculative builders, isn't going to cut it either. And I think we should talk in the discussion, hopefully, because I need to wrap up, um, about how this attempt to prop up the pre-existing system relates to the broader economy. Um, the, what recovery we've seen, uh, the recovery, is from as I understand it, very much consumption driven at the moment. And I think house prices uh, play a large role in that, if only because they make people feel more wealthy. I don't know the exact rates of extra withdrawal and how that's in driving consumption, but it certainly is an aspect of confidence which I think the government will be worried about allowing to slide at this point. Um, and that's it really. Again, just to reiterate that also, I haven't focused on it, but it's massively important at a time when access to, to and affordability of housing are both worse probably than in living memory, um, attacks on social housing are intensifying. You know, and I hope as we move on, as I hope we will in the discussion, talk about what we should be doing about it. The way I see it is a kind of two-pronged challenge. We both need to be attacking, um, challenging specific attacks on the way on social housing and the people's quality of housing in the private rental sector and indeed in the owner occupation sector as well, as well as having these kind of more fundamental debates about people having a right to a house and a house not just being a means for certain people to accumulate wealth. I'll stop it there. Thank you.